Howdy and welcome back to my Bevy 11 intro series. Last time we got a character moving around on screen. Now we're going to learn how to create our own components and resources and implement a basic gameplay loop. So first up, we want to create our own component. Components in Bevy can be constructed out of any Rust data type including struts and enums that are send and sync. Practically, this means that all plain old data types can be used in components. For our first component, we're going to clean up movement by creating a player component. We just need to create the strut, add the field for the speed, and derive component. It's my practice to make the fields of my component public because they are the public interface of my game and projects, but you can restrict the visibility here if you want or need to. Now, when we create the sprite bundle, we can wrap it in a tuple and add a player component. Notice the new parentheses. Bevy will treat tuples of components as bundles. You can also use the old technique of spawning the sprite bundle and then inserting the player component, but this is not preferred anymore and it has a minor performance cost. Next, in our character movement system, we can change the sprite component reference to our new player component. This means that the query will only match our character and not any other sprites. Also, because we now have read-only access to the player component, we can get it from our duration and use the speed value to calculate our movement amount. As a quick exercise, you can try to solve the issue of diagonal movement being faster here if you want. I'm also going to change our camera settings real quick. I personally don't like working in screen pixel values, and my new favorite camera scaling mode is Auto Min, and this lets us have some reasonable game world coordinates to work with. You can play around with other camera modes to find one that matches the resizing behavior you like. Our units now are going to be our pixel art units, so I can remove the sprite size from our character. This is just a personal preference though. Next up, let's learn how to create our own resources. For this game, I want the player to have a limited amount of money that we're spending and trying to earn. This makes sense to be a resource because we want to only have one instance of this in our game, and Bevy forces resources to be unique. We could also have it be a component on the character entity, but this comes down to a case-by-case -case decision. In practice, I see a lot of things people think should be resources actually becoming components, and Bevy has even migrated the window itself to be a component, so it's always worth thinking about. For this game though, I think this should be fine as a resource. To create a resource, again any send and sync data type will work, and there's also a non-send resource type for more exotic use cases. We just create the strut and then derive resource on it. We can add the resource into our app using the insert resource function. We can also implement default for a resource and then use the init resource function and Bevy will add the default version. Finally, Bevy has a special trait called from world that lets us create resources given access to the entire ECS world. This is mostly useful for things like rendering where you might want access to the render device and it's more of an intermediate feature though. Now let's add a real gameplay element to our project. I want to be able to spawn pigs for $10 anytime I press space. To do this, I want to create a new system called spawn pig. As a naming convention, I use the spawn prefix before any system that is spawning entities. This system will need the mutable commands to spawn the pig like we did last time, the asset server to load the pig sprite, the keyboard input resource again, mutable access to the player's money, and a query for the player to find the player's position. If you get an error that money isn't added to the game, make sure that you've inserted it into the app. For this query, we're going to use a new feature of queries, filters. Queries actually accept two generic parameters, one for the data we want and one to filter the query by. There's a couple of ways to filter a query that we'll see, but the most common are with and without constraints. For this query, we want the transform data read only for all of the entities that have the player component. Our filters and our data requests can both be tuples, and this gives us tons of control as to what will match our queries and what data we'll get. Bevy is very smart under the hood and is always running every system in parallel if it can. This causes some complexities with ordering that we'll look at as we go on, but it also gives a massive performance boost to all Bevy games by default. Bevy must follow Rust borrow checker rules though, so we can't get read access to a component if another system is mutating it and this will cause some systems to need to wait for others to finish. This is why when you're creating queries, you want to be as conservative as possible when getting read and write access. Now, in the pig spawning system, I want to spawn a pig when space is pressed. 
Just pressed will only be true for the frame that the key is pressed, while the pressed function that we used last time is true for as long as the button is down. I'm going to invert the if statement and return if the key is not pressed to reduce the nesting here. Next up, we want to get the player transform. We can use the single function on queries to get our data if we know that one and only one entity will match the query. There's also the get single function that will give us a recoverable Rust result if you want to use the Rust error handling for safety. This result will also tell you if the query failed because no entity matched or more than one matched the query. Now I want to check if we have enough money to pay for the pig, and if I do, then I'll subtract $10 from our current money. Here, because we don't have UI yet, I can use info statements to alert the player that the money was spent on the command line. Finally, we can load the pig sprite and spawn a pig at the player's transform. Now all I need to do is add this to the update schedule on our app and I can spawn 10 pigs. The add systems call also allows for a tuple of systems, which I'll use here for convenience. As our final task for today, let's create another component for our pigs. For gameplay, I want the pigs to age for a little bit and then die and give the player more money than they spent on the pig originally. I'm going to create a pig component with a built-in tool Bevy gives us called a timer. Timers are a fundamental tool in Bevy and work exactly like you'd expect. I'll add our pig component to our pigs when we spawn them and set the timer to last for 2 seconds and to be in the time mode once. This means that the timer is intended to only finish one time and won't loop. The other mode is a repeating timer, which will automatically start over in a loop each time it finishes. Again, notice the extra tuple parentheses I added, so Spawn will see both the sprite bundle and our pig component as one giant bundle. Timers will not automatically tick, and there are responsibility to keep updated. To do this, I'll make another system called Pig Lifetime. Here, I want commands to despawn dead pigs, the time resource, a query for all the pig components mutably, and the money to give our player income when the pig dies. For the pig query, I also want to get the entity that matched the query. This is a special value and is the only thing that doesn't need an ampersand in the first query generic parameter. Remember that entities are just ID numbers and have no other data with them, so we're getting each pig's ID number. This will be used to tell the commands which pig to despawn. Despawning is probably the most common reason why I get the entity value in queries, but it also has some other interesting uses that we might see. Because both the spawn pig system and the pig lifetime system get money mutably, Bevy will not be able to run these in parallel. This usually is not important because they are short running systems, but it's always good to keep that in your mind in case you find yourself mutating a giant resource in every single system or something like that. Now, in this system, we can loop over all of the pig components and tick the lifetime timers. If the timer is finished, then we want to give the player money and despawn the pig. And again, we'll use the debugging output to alert the player of this. To despawn the pig, we first call commands.entity with the pig's entity. This gives us back a new type called entity commands. Here we can do things by modifying the entity by adding or removing components, or we can do what we're going to do and just call despawn. Once again, remember to add this system to our app builder and update, and now we have a nice little gameplay loop where the player can earn money. We covered a fair bit of material in this episode, and I think this is a good stopping point. We learned how to create our own components and resources, how to filter queries, how to write some gameplay logic, how to use timers, and how to despawn entities. For homework, I would recommend you look at the bevy docs for timers. It's a pretty simple page, and I'm not going to cover all of the details in this series. I also recommend trying to write a system to have the pigs wander around the screen for a little bit before they die. As always, I hope this was a helpful video, and thank you so much to my wonderful Patreons for making this possible. Thank you for watching.